Hello, you are welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Coming to you from my home in Arlington, Virginia, a suburb of Washington, D.C. I am Shakasari. And today we are exploring whether having elections can be considered a prerequisite for democratic governance. Joining us from here in Washington, D.C. are two distinguished guests. Dr. Piwokule Munyandu, a lecturer at Howard University here in Washington, D.C., and Norman Mbabazi, a Ugandan lawyer who is visiting the United States. Well, gentlemen, I have to say that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa. Pleasure is all ours. It's good to be here. Good to be here. It's always a pleasure talking to you guys. And uh, let me wish you, by the way, a hugely happy and prosperous 2021. Thank you, Shaka. The Thank same you. to you. Mm -hmm. you're, you're most welcome, gentlemen. Now, gentlemen, uh, we're going to be talking about um, whether holding elections is a prerequisite for democratic or good governance. What, for example, would you say makes an election acceptable to all the parties involved? Makes an election, for example, which can be characterized as free, fair, transparent, verifiable, and a credible election. Professor. I'm going to uh, perhaps start by uh, using a, 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 an example I'm personally familiar with, South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and I will perhaps uh, answer your question uh, by defining a, a credible election and a fair election by what actually um, sh exists and what doesn't exist at a certain time. One, there was a time in South Africa until 1994 that not everyone could vote. And so there was democracy, but it was esoteric. It was only for, um, for, for uh, white citizens of South Africa. So, that was, so any election, then, therefore, that took place before 1994 could not be said to have been credible, fair, and so on and so forth. So we could say then, to choose from that, that a fair and credible election involves the participation of all citizens. In, their, in electing their representative. So full participation guaranteed, um, and the election must be in South Africa, people emphasized this a lot in 1994, free of intimidation, and the, choice, and the election itself, as far as each citizen, must be a secret ballot. No one must know what you voted, in other words. So these three ingredients, primary ingredients, I would say, using the case of South Africa in 1994, I think I formed a benchmark for the country from which other uh, characteristics, of course, uh, m m may uh, cohere, I would say. But that's a good start. So, Doctor, could we then say that uh, perhaps what you are actually trying to put across is that in South Africa, during the apartheid era, we did have what appeared to be democratic elections, but that perhaps these elections, in fact, were a sort of selective democracy, the sort of elections that uh, were clearly not inclusive. Indeed. That is why the word I used was esoteric democracy, uh, only for a few. So the access, there was a, a gatekeeping according to race. And, and so if you were 80% of the population of South Africa, you never knew democracy within the borders of the country until 1994. So if you talk to a South African today, who's, uh, let's just say, the, at the age of 55 and above, uh, if they, vote, they voted, they remember that election for the rest of their lives, because it was the first time that they and all of us, as a result, tasted democracy. So an election must have, as it must guarantee full participation, and it must guarantee secrecy of the ballot. 
so that there's no retribution uh, afterwards uh, in areas that are considered uh, a stronghold of this and that a party. I think that's a good benchmark we can take away from the, 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 the small example of South Africa. Interesting. What about you, um, Norman Mbabazi? Is that something that you would agree with? Speaking from uh, my experience from uh, Uganda, where our, the, we've, been, we've had uh, a series of uh, coups instead of elections, and the, the times we attempted to have elections in the 80s, they, 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 they were rigged, and then the current president, General President Museveni, at the time felt that... Uh, the, the nature of elections that had been organized by the then government were not those that brought out the, 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 the characteristics of a democratic society. And uh, when he went to the bush, his idea was he, he was fighting to, 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 for the people to recover their freedom and to be able to exercise their will as democracy requires. However, after that, in 1986, when he took over power, the first uh, times when, until 1996, when we held the first election under his regime. And uh, a, 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 an election which is characterized where, by the incumbent uh, appointing the referee of the election, where he's playing as a, 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 a player, creates such a situation that uh, if you don't ref if you don't make reference to me as the leader or as the winner, you will not. Why did I appoint you to be a referee in this game? So, and he has profoundly said that we can we shall not prepare elections for you to win us. In other words, the elections are mm -hmm. a face. So the president will always win, but the people will lose. In other words, the democracy in the Ugandan elections, I, in my opinion, have never seemed to reflect the intentions or the will of the electorate. Mm. So I could simply put it that uh, the many times we've had elections in Uganda, the winner or the, 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 uh, the selected winner for that matter has always been the one who appoints the referee. So. For me, the starting point of a democratic election or an election which has a semblance of democracy, the Electoral Commission must be independent in such a way that it has the will to properly declare the winner if at all the incumbent has lost. And, uh, you know, and other characteristics definitely follow a, 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 an impartial judicial, judicial system that if the election, there is a petition, they will substantially look at all the matters to be able to bring out the real issues that occurred in such an election. What about um, a free or independent media that uh, can be accessible by the all parties competing, for example, in an election? Um, right from 2001, uh, 2011, and 2016, those have been issues pointed out in the various election petitions that should be considered and reformed such that all the participants are able to get uh, access to media coverage because how else shall we know the competence of an election if the media is closed out you've been seeing in the elections current campaigns that have been going on that uh, almost 39 journalists were their credentials were taken away and uh, the, 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 the accrediting body also has an appointment by the, same, uh, the incumbent who definitely will not accredit various independent journalists who are moving alongside uh, the various uh, campaigning candidates to be able to capture what's happening on ground. Mm -hmm. So indeed, if we don't have a good media, a media law which allows all the participants to access, uh, to have good publicity, if you don't have uh, a, a system which is free for media reporting, where there is no censorship, you know, uh, in, in certain areas where the certain candidates would would even pay to be hosted on a TV or 
a radio program and uh, a few hours or even minutes to the program starting and you're told you, are, you cannot be allowed to be on this program. And then how else will you communicate to the people? Indeed. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, Norman, you basically pretty much um, characterized uh, the type of elections that happen or obtain in Uganda. How do you respond to President Yoweri Tibuhaburwa, who is on record saying that yes, he actually went to the bush to fight for the restoration of democracy in Uganda, and that he in fact brought you back your democracy. How do you react to that? He, for me, in my opinion, I think he mis he he misrepresents democracy and the semblance of stability in a country. Much as many times he refers to stability in 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 sense to mean democracy. His idea is you are able to speak, you, you can you can uh, you are able to speak as you wish. I've given you freedom of speech, restricted freedom of speech, by the way, and uh, you are able to engage in electoral processes. But these electoral processes are tagged with a lot of circumstances. For example, if you go, there's the, 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 the electoral process, which is marred with intimidation, availability of security forces at the electoral places, failure to allow all the contestants to navigate the country as they wish, gagging consultations. It is a semblance of democracy in his own words, but in my opinion, that that democracy that he preaches does not necessarily reflect the, 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 cons, the contents of democracy, especially in, a, in a, an electoral process. Interesting. Now, Dr. Muyandu, how do you, how do you um, define or how do you um, characterize democracy? We know, for example, that uh, the, the one great American president by the name Abraham Lincoln, I remember that name precisely because, in fact, I first came across it when I was in Kigez High School primary. <laughs> in Kabale, in primary six, <laughs> studying civics. Mm -hmm. And when they said democracy, the next thing you'd hear is Abraham Lincoln. That Abraham Lincoln once said that in his view, democracy is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. What is your definition of democracy as you have seen it being practiced on the ground in Africa? Hmm. I, I, it's an onerous task, uh, Shaga. I don't think a humble man like myself could give an adequate enough uh, definition of democracy. So I'll, I'll even defer to that one and just um, add to it. Uh, democracy, uh, especially in even in Southern Africa, I would say, is a dynamic system a dynamic system characterized by change. And, and also it's an asymmetric, a, a asymmetrical system. Now it's not equal in, any, in many other countries, though it may look so, right? So it's dynamic, characterized by constant change, asymmetrical, it's applied differently or it occurs differently in various countries. And then of course, whereby the people themselves choose their representatives. And I'll just maintain that humble definition because once we, uh, w w we give it, we, we start from a humble standpoint when we're defining democracy, we're able to appreciate something very important with democracy in Africa, how it hasn't, it, it has taken, it has undergone various stages depending on the country. Some countries uh, have what we might call a mature democracy. What do I mean by that? That is when the party that brought independence has been successfully challenged 
Sometimes it has um, it been um, unseated, as we saw in Zambia. Sometimes it has been challenged to the point of almost uh, losing, and some might say lost, as in the case of ZANU PF in Zimbabwe in 2008. And then you have um, nascent democracies. Nascent democracies would be South Africa, would be uh, with ANC, Swapo in Namibia, Frelimo in uh, Mozambique, Chama Chama Pindudzi in Tanzania, where the parties of independence, the ones that say, um, and I think this claim sometimes we are being unfair to the parties, so I will not evaluate whether it's good or it's right or wrong for them to say this, but where they say we brought you like in, in the Macafe, case of Uganda, as um, Paul has outlined, where they say we brought you independence. Uh, These Ryan, are nascent democracies. Ryan. Whether they've been a democracy for 30 years or 20, they're nascent because the, the party that rules has not been successfully um, put through a referendum, a successful referendum, or defeated. How do you respond to some who would, in fact, look at uh, that type of democracy? as a government of some people, by some <laughs> people, and for some people. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think that there are, um, there are, this is why it's important, full participation guaranteed is an important benchmark of democracy. Because once some people find it easier to vote and some do not, once there are barriers to uh, election, uh, in, uh, in the case of Africa, a barrier could simply be how far is the voting booth in this village? So if you have to walk over five kilometers in order to vote in a place where, in a village where more, not a lot of people have cars, that means the person who brings a bus to transport all of you in this valley, and if that person is wearing a shirt of a certain party, and even if it doesn't say the name, by simply wearing green in Tanzania, you are left with no doubt as to the patronage to whom you owe your vote. And so such practices, these are nuanced practices. So we must have a very clear eye and be careful when we're looking at them. But such practices actually fight against democracy. And what about you, Norman? What is uh, your definition of democracy? as you know it, and, and as you also have lived through that type of experience? Well, um, in a democratic, in a, in a de a democratic uh, state that I envisage to see uh, many years to come, probably for Uganda, that is to say, where we expect full participation of uh, or the, the, the designed or the people who have reached the age of election, where we all access uh, media, where we there is no disenfranchisement of voters and uh, there is no intimidation. Now, in that state of expectation that my heart feels for, uh, I would, uh, moving away or trying to step aside from the normal norm of democracy being the being mm -hmm. related to only to numbers. They say democracy is for numbers. The bigger the number, that's the right democratic decision that has been taken. Now, if I were only to tackle the issue of numbers as a, as a principle of democracy, that creates a problem for Uganda, where the numbers are always computed by certain groups of people and only given to the, the chairman of the electoral commission to announce. So ideally, it would be democratic in their minds, but because it's a numbers game, but the process and the procedure to arrive at a democratic election would have been marred by a lot of uh, activities which defeat the essence of democracy. Especially now, you, when, uh, the, the after effects of such uh, uh, an election in, a dem in the so-called democratic state is that um, it totally comes back to what you have just said, a government for, a certain, for certain people, by certain people, because those people who participated in the making of that, uh, that government come through 
will definitely be the ones to benefit shortly after its existence. You know, um, Norman, I have looked at uh, the trajectory of democracy on the African continent during the last almost 30 years as a professional journalist. And I have found, and uh, this information is also corroborated by a lot of uh, African experts, African observers, policymakers um, in the Western world who interact and deal with Africa, that when you look at uh, the democratic trajectory as far as Africa is concerned, that it looks good. And the reason they say so is because they say, as you said much earlier, that there was a period in the history of Africa where you hardly held elections. And of course, as we have heard, even in South Africa during apartheid, where they could hold an election, that election was clearly not an inclusive type of democracy. So the, these people say, when they look at the trajectory of democracy on the African continent, they say it is better because, in their view, most African countries hold periodic elections. How do you respond to that? The, the only elections that are held are, in my opinion, are simply to legitimize the, car, the, the regime. But they are not uh, the process. Because you see, election, elections are two things. It is the process and the result. So if you tamper with the process, then you have ideally managed the result, ultimately. Now, what happens in many of these African countries is the process is completely distorted in the sense that, uh, of, for example, at the time when Uganda first felt the, the nature of opposition politics, that's uh, during the time of Dr. Kiza Vesije, he truly stood out as uh, because he was formerly with the ruling party defected formed his own party and he had all the weight with him and he created the, he, his time we felt at that that was the time when uganda witnessed the the, the strength of the opposition dr kiza Vesige, with all his might at the time was arrested not less than 200 times or more every other minute he was arrested all all at any one point he attempted to visit a certain uh, uh, constituency there was intimidation by the the the, the military the military i want to say that the electoral process in many african countries has been militarized in the sense that you will not go anywhere during even the for example after elections we have a five-year period and during that time, the gentleman, Dr. Kiza Vesige, in many times could not leave his home. He was not allowed to move. And for me, that's what I call the process. No man, wait, is... no man wait a minute. Uh, you mean Colonel Dr. Kiza Vesige was often arrested for no apparent reason at all? Or is it possible that perhaps he had violated some electoral codes? The many times he was arrested, it was for no apparent reason. Because even when he went to court, he was not, the, the, he was not, he was charged with flimsy, flimsy charges, and there was never any conviction. Legally, for me, that would be a malicious prosecution, because one, you don't have the facts, the law is not with you, but because of ulterior political motives. He always, even he could not go to his, at there's a point he couldn't go to his bank. Because when he moved out, he was the people's president. 
the, the, the government feared his movement would converge people and could, uh, and that was a time when we were having a couple of uprisings in different uh, Arabian countries, the African, uh, African countries. And uh, the idea was that if the Ugandans are alert and alive to the events in the other African countries, Uganda would also catch the same flu. So they, uh, they, they, they deliberately kept him inside his house to avoid such a situation where he will converge people probably as he moves around and cause peaceful demonstration. He always had peaceful demonstrations. He was the peaceful demonstrations only turned violent when the police tried to block them and stop them from moving or showing their their reasons why they are coming out. So I don't think that the gagging or the restraining of the of Dr. Kiza Vesige was always based on merit, but rather flouting the process of having a democratic election. You described him as uh, having been perceived by people as court, unquote, people's president. Yes. Why was he called uh, the people's president? And by whom? <laughs> and for, and, and why? I mean, and we, for what? Because the people did, did not believe in the outcomes of the election. They always believed that he won the elections. And to the people, that is their person. The will of the people, in their numbers, they believe they chose Dr. Kiza Vesiji as their president. But he, the, 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 uh, Mr. Museveni was selected for that position, but rather not elected as the people had done so. That's why he is called the people's president. That sounds like uh, you describing a cult and perhaps Dr. Colonel Chiza Besige as the cult leader. The only <laughs> other person I remember in history who was so popular, in fact globally, was Muhammad Ali, formerly Cassius Clay. Yes. At one time, obviously, the most prominent global fighter in terms of boxing, the heavyweight champion. People could not believe, even when he was beaten very badly in Madison Square Garden in New York by Joe Frazier, they still thought he had won, and they called him the people's champion, Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Muhammad Ali. Even though in many ways one could argue that he probably deserved it, given the kind of prominence he really did, <laughs> and some of the important causes that he embraced, that made him obviously the individual that was globally loved, adored, worshipped to some, ex some degree, as a matter of fact. I think, um, if I may, I think some of one of um, this uh, this discussion <clears throat> when uh, when someone has not won or is perceived to have, uh, but is perceived to have won the election, whether rightly or wrongly, I think it, it brings a very important uh, uh, aspect of African democracy with, with which we must contend. This idea um, that one personality, whether they are opposition or not, uh, tends to encapsulate or capture. Uh, the support of a region or sometimes a, an ethnicity. So in our analysis of African democracy, we must not leave uh, the exceptions exist there and there, but we must also contend with this idea. I think um, uh, fool ourselves sometimes when we're looking at Africans and their choices sometimes. In some countries, a, a one person or a dynasty or, or a, a, an opposition party sometimes they tend to uh, be viewed as coming from one region or ethnicity. And I think uh, in, its time, in its quest to be fair and to improve, uh, and, it's a, a, and this occurs um, differently in various countries, but Africans have kind of have failed to contend with, um, with this dynamic of their lives. That um, so in some places, even if you put, you know, uh, just me, a short man uh, from South Africa, but if I'm, you know, a certain ethnicity or from a a certain region, 
I will capture the vote there. So our improvement of African democracy must seek to improve uh, how this take how this is moderated and how this affects people's lives. Time is not our best ally, so we shall go for a break. And when we come back, we shall continue with the discussion. So please, don't go away. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, and today we are exploring whether having elections can be considered a prerequisite for democratic governance. My distinguished guests are Puokule Munyandu, lecturer of African Studies at Howard University here in Washington, D.C., and Norman Mbabazi, a lawyer with Nyanzi, Chiboneka, and Mbabazi advocates in Uganda, who is currently visiting the United States. What about, um, you know, uh, going back a little bit back to the issue that I raised earlier of the democratic trajectory? What do you think about uh, this business of observers and experts talking about when it comes to democracy, at least in the view of those, some experts and what have you, they see democracy being on the upswing. They talk about, again, how we hold periodic elections, even <coughs> when, in fact, you have a situation where in many countries across the continent, yes, they hold periodic elections, but at the end of the day, the results, in fact, reflect not the will of the voters, not the will of the people, but the will of the individual who announces the results or the individuals who actually count the votes. Are we, I mean, are, should we really be satisfied with the fact that Africa is conducting periodic elections or should we be looking at conducting elections that have merit? Elections that really are quality elections, like South Africa, for example, I think this is a very good question, uh, Dr. Shara, because it, it puts the ball of democracy and its improvement back to the Africans' courts. Because uh, then this way, Africans themselves are able in each country to look at themselves um, in the mirror and say, well, what have we done wrong? And what organic uh, endogenous emanating from within the country, what endogenous mechanisms can we or should we improve? This idea uh, of, e of election observers, it, it has helped in, in, in some countries, to, especially in South Africa, where it, we, we really needed a, a, a fair um, assessment from outside. However, um, we can trace this idea of um, kind of conditions <clears throat> back to the 1990s, the structural adjustments and so on and so forth, where you needed aid, you needed to do this and that, A, B, C, check these boxes, and you'd get aid. What that did, Dr. Shaga, it crept into the political space where the African leaders in many countries learned the, the rituals of a democracy. In other words, they learned to check the boxes so that when the observers from outside come, an exogenous process of assessment, when they come to, uh, they will find everything correct and take the next flight away, but democracy in effect has not actually taken place. So the challenge then, which I think your question alludes to, is that the Africans themselves must now find, and looking forward, that's why I'm optimistic, um, they must find endogenous ways to assess their own democracies and improve them themselves. Rulers must stop taking their own people through the motions. No. They should deliver democracy. Because democracy probably is really one of the prerequisites for bringing about 
social, economic, political, cultural justice for all. The moment we we have a situation where the the, the political leaders choose the, the referee, I always refer to this word referee because of my love for football. Mm -hmm. The moment. <laughs> The moment the referee... not, only, not only, by the way, do those individuals choose the referee only. Okay. They also go on and choose the lion's men. In fact, to a yes. certain extent, they even choose the spectators. And, and uh, the only thing they probably don't do really is to stop somebody to access oxygen. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so... Uh, the moment we have that situation continuing for in very many African countries, it is going to become a very a, a tense moment for the development that we we urge for, because many times these selected leaders who have the referee by themselves, who have the liners men, the the the, the lack and and they go on further and even the, deactivate civil civil society civil society works. They turn out, uh, they start taking on very vigorous and violent actions against the media and journalists. So if that doesn't stop, it is going to continue in such a way that all, all the time the leaders and will never deliver that democracy because most, many times our president has once said, Mr. Seven, that for him, he's working for his grandchildren and his children which means the will of the people that put him in that office and he further said he's not a servant of anybody so in such a state where someone is not a servant of anybody who is also working for his children and his grandchildren what do you expect from such a, a, a leader what is he going to deliver will he really deliver democracy or will he simply deliver what is favorable for his children, his grandchildren, unless for the people that purportedly put him into power? Remember, people vote. Apparently, they go to the voting station. They, some will be intimidated. Others will not turn up. The referee is on his side. So, And then he tops that up by saying he's a revolutionary leader and Africa still needs him. He has a lot of work to do. So, I, I, and I want to remind you, Dr. Shaka, that this is a gentleman who said Africa's problem is leaders who overstay in power. <laughs> well, he has since amended that, that uh, he actually meant leaders who stay longer in power without being elected by their people. Ah, amazing amendment. Yeah. But staying with the Ugandan okay. President Yoweri Museveni, you said mm. that he has actually said he, he is driven by working for his children and his grandchildren. Did he in fact say that or was he in fact misquoted in fairness to him? Um, if you come out on, on, on an interview on TV and you say something like that and you mention how you're working for that group of people, a select group of people, in all fairness, whether misquoted or not, it is, for me, in my opinion, it's unfair for a president to categorically enslave himself and narrow the margin of his expected output specifically to a certain group of people. My opinion would still not be different that he actually meant what he said, I in see. all fairness. I see. Well, there's that, there doesn't seem to be a shortage of people who call them leaders or rulers who apparently seem to have a sense of ownership a sense of entitlement, as a matter of fact, because they say they and their colleagues woke up very early in the morning, went to the bush with the AK-47s, seized the power, and they say that the fact that they were doing that precisely because they were liberating you. 
And because they say they were liberating you, not necessarily liberating themselves, they are entitled to calling shots in their countries. I make reference to General Muntu. One time, he one of the conversations we had with him, General Mogisha Muntu was formerly the commander of the Uganda People's Defense Forces. And uh, in the UPDF Act, he exists among the mentioned uh, as part of the council. You know, he, they, 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 they have gone forward to also indicate who of these soldiers, the 23 that uh, liberated the, the country. The 27, the enormous 27, 27, yes. The 27 <laughs> that liberated the country. And they appear in a legislation to effect that they are the ones. They keep reminding us, and we are reminded, of course. So General Mugisha Muntu said that as they were final, as they were getting done or towards the end of the war, some of the some of the issues that he raised is are we really still up to the task of liberating the people, or are we now to a new task of enriching ourselves? That during that time, he had observed some of his comrades had started earmarking certain properties that they would take over shortly after they had won the war. So it, 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 it answers the question of entitlement, that see, the moment they felt the war was coming to the end, they started thinking of how they should do, reward themselves for the, the, the war of liberation. Now, the question is, were they liberating us or they went into this art or the topic of liberation purposely for financial gain and to help themselves? Probably of all they had been deprived of, mm. that was the time for them to enrich themselves. Very interesting. Uh, you know, um, Professor, um, let's, let's look for some practical solutions here. Africa sincerely needs democracy, and democracy needs Africa. You know, on March 6, 1957, there was a gentleman called Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. He regained his country's political independence from the British. That country was called the Gold Coast. He renamed it the Republic of Ghana. And in his address to the people of Ghana, he challenged them. He said, the independence of Ghana would be meaningless unless it was linked with the total liberation of the rest of Africa. He did not only talk the talk. He actually walked that talk by providing the necessary tools so that the African people could, in fact, walk the walk, which they did in 1994 by South Africa becoming independent and ending apartheid under the leadership of the Madiba, the first indigenous South African president, Nelson Mandela. You know, I often wonder, South Africa is regarded by many as the beacon of hope for African democracy. Could it be that perhaps South Africa in fact has a responsibility to help democratize the rest of Africa? I would be very um, skeptical of uh, any effort to kind of to enjoin South Africa in a in a continental uh, project because there are many factors that um, that I play here that um, that would determine the outcome of such an intervention. Some of these factors are, for example, are the are, are the countries whom South Africa would like to um, <clears throat> help with democracy are they francophone or anglophone? 
right? Because this will determine certain interests that might actually, or certain spheres of existence uh, that might not uh, be, that might be disrupted by South Africa trying this project. And another question I would ask, is South Africa up to the task? And I'm sorry, Shaga, to disappoint, but I'll say no, because South Africa has its own problems at home. <clears throat> Number one, in South Africa, the, an opposition has not won over 22%. So that means, that's why I call South Africa a nascent democracy. That means any opposition that has ever existed has a vote ceiling of 22%. And um, that is not bad if you're thinking of it that, well, it's democracy and the people voted. But that is bad if you're thinking about the fact that, well, if you know you have a uh, you've cornered the vote, are you going to uh, deliver on many of your promises, especially developmental ones, when you know, look, uh, the ANC will win again and again? So that means we must, for South Africa, we must rely on the ANC democratic processes themselves within the ANC, knowing that whoever the ANC puts most likely wins the election, at least for the foreseeable future. And on that score, I would say the, the ANC is found wanting because um, the, right now it's undergoing a war of attrition between the factions that won um, uh, and um, uh, as, uh, uh, from on which Aramakosa ascended to power. So South Africa, I, I would say, is very busy with its own problems to be doing much um, proselytizing of democracy on the continent, however desirable that is even to me. But South Africa dominates or at least domin at least attempts to dominate africa when it comes to business if it can in fact if it can in fact dominate africa in terms of business you go across the african continent and see a lot of these large shopping malls from southern africa through eastern africa to west africa i have been through south african shopping morals if it can do that really why can't it also provide what is even more important the inference the foundation which is a political infrastructure of democracy as opposed to simply looking at the superstructures yes sir in fact um, you can also look at mtn the telecommunications company it has become continental I would say that there are various reasons for this, but essentially, I'll, 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 let me deal with two. One, there is a historical reason for South Africa's reticence. Uh, South Africa is, is still a, a teenager amongst the free nations of Africa as far as time. So South Africa, the South Africans are quite uh, sensitive to this aspect of their, of, of, of their existence within the continent. So they are always stepping with the light foot because the, any country can always remind South Africa that look, like Zimbabwe just did four months ago when South Africa sought to be um, kind of more assertive regarding migration from Zimbabwe. And the Zimbabweans told South Africans in no uncertain terms that Zimbabwe is not a province of South Africa. And South Africa had no answer to that. So South Africa uh, is very sensitive to us being perceived as a neo-colonialist because also um, of the problems that used to come from South Africa during apartheid times. So it's very easy then to tell South Africans for any country that's misbehaving, look, don't come here with that apartheid mentality and the South Africans will shirk that responsibility. Another reason, of course, is that um, South Africa is, uh, it, 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 said it has developmental problems of its own. And so the business being ahead actually helps South Africa's budget back home than any democratic project. And, and a third and final reason would be, it's not, uh, South Africa looks at these high expectations of it as not fair, because um, you also, when you're traveling around Africa, Dr. Shaga, see a, a lot of Chinese companies. Uh, the, the South Africans would say, you, why we don't, should we ask the Chinese to help us also politically? So it's just business and there's politics. This is why I come back to the point that Africans must find endogenous ways to assess and improve their own democracy. You mean indigenous ways? Indeed, uh, 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 Dr. Shaga. Uh, a good country on this is Malaysia. Malaysia uh, found out early on 
that um, if you have these e elected leaders uh, who come and pander after every five years and then go away after the promises, uh, there's a certain instability associated with this. But also, they, they were in a dilemma because they said, well, we still want democracy. So how do we merge these? Malaysia was brave and prescient. They have over five sultanates in Malaysia. In other words, what in Africa we call traditional leaders. So there's a council that sits of these traditional leaders, and it's not beholden to the government. So they actually certify the election of a prime minister. So if you run for an election in Malaysia, you still have to go to the king, and the king changes between the sultanates every 10 years, I stand for correction. But the point here is that you no longer need outside observers because you have people who have much more to lose guarding the elections and they're not beholden to the, um, to the, um, to the, ele to the electoral winds that blow every five or, or six years. Interesting. Earlier, uh, Norman, uh, Dr. Pookure raised the issue of uh, what he characterized as uh, the francophone, okay. the anglophone. Mm -hmm. He might, in fact, have added the Russophone or Russophonic, essentially those that were under the Portuguese. Mm -hmm. But what about his emphasis on the indigenous? What about, for example, promoting the issue of the Bantu, who basically have traced their origins in the Cameroon and crisscrossed the continent up to, in fact, Southern Africa. What about Africa uniting along the Bantu phone, or rather, in fact, as someday I was having an interview with Ugandan President General Yoweri Museveni Tibu Haburwa, and he mentioned what he characterized as Africa phone. Why not that? <laughs> Philosophically, that is a very good idea. It's an ideal, <laughs> it's, it's an ideal state of mind. For example, if you see the European Union, they have also done their union based on the, 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 their culture and uh, the way they would want development and all that kind of stuff. Um, when you look at the African countries... But of course, country, experiencing some political hiccups, hence it, Brexit. It, it, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that is what I was trying to, I was going to, that uh, the Bantu, the, uh, the Bantu form for countries that relate or have history with Bantu would have been uh, a very ideal club for for the <laughs> president to sit and take tea. But I will give you an example in East Africa. In East Africa, we we are struggling with the the, the, the East African community. Yes. But uh, one of the key issues that arise is that uh, one, you have a country which which has the so-called the democratic elections for Kenya five every five years they change presidency mm -hmm. we are not sure we don't I wouldn't want to comment on the process in this East African community that we are facing today where we have for example Kenya they change leaders or they go for elections they I have term want limits. To, yes they have term limits every after five they, they they say every five years but normally the incumbent holds on to the next term. Same is with uh, Tanzania under CCM. And uh, Rwanda recently has gone to seven years. And then you have Uganda, which is a, a, which has a president who has been in power for 34 years. So what are these people really going to talk about? When First of all, they have difference in ideology. We have one who believes he's the patron of all of these other leaders. He has a historical attachment to each and every leader save Tanzania, of course, who have taken office in many of these East African countries, you know. So for me, uh, in, in Africa or in East Africa for now, I would think having, the, having corporations, we still have to deal with our internal politics, so that we are closely at the semblance of levels so that we can be able to, to, to debate issues sensibly. Mm -hmm. Because if we are going to talk about a development issue mm -hmm. and you're having a, a constitutional 
default in your back home yeah. and the other one is having another yeah. issue of, of yeah. a would be a situation that's not in favor with the corporation then that kills that entire yeah. you know coming together that kills the club of tea takers as presidents yeah. you've seen brexit is not any is, is not any different you know many times they, actually they would have broken up long time ago because there was an imbalance in the economic uh, e existence between these countries as well as policies immigration among others so the bantu phone good idea ideal situation but not acceptable at this time yeah, if I may, uh, Dr. Shaga, may yes, I? Please. Yes, please. It goes back to the point I made earlier that the mm -hmm. African leaders ha have found out, they know the narrative, they mm -hmm. know the talking points, and they, they, they know how to perform the rituals. And some of these rituals involve a certain gospel, and this gospel usually is Pan-Africanism, anti-colonialism, anti-neo-colonialism. And we know quite well that, for example, in Zimbabwe, one of the a lauded as a supreme pan-Africanist was actually your actually uh, uh, prof, uh, pre ex president uh, Robert Mugabe the late actually presided over a kleptocracy for decades that, that that took everything from the country sent it outside banks and the children of MPs uh, having fancy houses in South Africa but the, the, he was speaking the gospel on YouTube he's a star lot of of subscribers on all his speeches. But the Pan-Africanism, in effect, and what it was supposed to bring, we're not, they, we know they don't occur in Zimbabwe, or we don't find the, the effect. So I agree with Norman on taking a dim view on uber Pan-Africanism, that behind which is actually kleptocracy and lack of um, accountability within the country. So <clears throat> African leaders, they know how to talk Pan-Africanism. And so that is why whenever we, we quote Kwame Nkrumah, and we quote all these the speeches from the, our very bright past, but we know that uh, Pan-Africanism must still pass through the eye of the needle. And that eye of the needle is the country, the nation state, and whether or not the leaders in the nation state are accountable. And so far, uh, if we are to judge Pan-Africanism and its prospects by how, for example, Zimbabwe turned out to be uh, in the last five years, uh, the, we, we would quite we would be very careful uh, jumping on it uh, without knowing the details. Are we talking about um, go, a good message needing a good messenger? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, and I think um, I'm a practical person, and in my uh, I, I try to uh, maybe it's me studying political economics, but. I, what does it have to do with food on the table, peace in the land, stability in the country? And so the, if you're going to just be the, the disciple of Pan-Africanism, but your country, in your country, people are starving because you took the budget from the Ministry of Health and half of it and you externalized it to be used by you and your cronies, then I don't want to hear about your Pan-Africanism, no matter how good it sounds. That makes the case, uh, you know, autocrats obviously like a situation where <laughs> they are in control of the state, yes. especially given that the state in those particular contexts is the single largest employer and is the single largest contractor. 